Yeah. Uh, good evening, members of the board, uh, attending uh, neighbors and friends. My name is Tim Johnson, the project architect. Uh, this is a proposed uh, residential development. Uh, this is our third presentation to the board, uh, third redesign. And just to give you an idea of where this site is located, uh, here's Hancock and here's Adams where they converge. Right before is Johnson Ave, and then Gilson Road. This is a unique site in many ways. Uh, it is accessed by two roads at ends of the, different ends of the property. It has an 11-foot grade change from Johnson to Gilson. And the zoning district boundary cuts through the property. So it's been a very, uh, it's a very difficult site, but we feel that we've provided a solution a design solution that uh, fits well with the, what the abutters were looking for and also what the board was looking for. So, having said that, our last scheme that we presented was a five-story, 24-unit building with 39 parking spaces. This, or 38 parking spaces. This scheme before you was a five-story building, 18 dwelling units, and 29 parking spaces, which gives a parking ratio of 1.6 spaces per dwelling unit, 1.5 is required. And the entire building footprint is in the business C zoning district. We do not encroach on the residence A zoning district, as we did in the previous scheme. So this is the, this is the view from Johnson Ave, showing the garage entrance and the main entrance. This is the view from Gilson, showing the garage entrance and the main entrance. In the previous scheme, we had columns in the ground, making the building appear more massive. All the columns are down. All the columns are gone. Everything is either cantilevered or overhanging on the building. The footprint is entirely in business C zoning district. So, these will be 18 dwelling units, uh, two bedroom, two bath, around 1,100 square feet. Uh, we have an elevator <coughs> servicing all floors, which makes each unit handicap adaptable. This is the site plan off of Gilson. Before, we were set back 30 feet from our, abut our abutter here on Linden Court. Now we're set back 60 feet. We are set back. We were set back 10 feet on the other sides, now we're set back 12 and a half feet. So we meet all the setback requirements for the zoning district. This is the site plan off of Johnson Ave, showing the right of way to our garage entrance and our main entrance. So we have six spaces, six, six parking spaces off this garage, off of Johnson Ave, and off of Gilson, we have 15 car garage. We've submitted a trash, a trash and recycling plan to the board tonight. We have a trash room on the Gilson side, and we have a trash room on the Johnson Ave side. We also have a landscape plan. Showing planting along the north side of the property, which is the, uh, the parking lot. We have planting along the east side, which is the abutter with Linden Court, and we have some miscellaneous planting along the other side of the building. Of course, this building will comply with the stretch energy code in the city of Quincy, which is 20% more energy efficient than current code. We also adhere to the Dark Sky Initiative. All lighting on this building will be one of two things, downlit and shielded, or on motion sensor. So, minimizing light pollution to our abutters. Exterior materials, we'll be using fiber cement products. I'm sure you're aware of several of them. Hardy plank, hardy plank, we have shingles in hardy plank and we have flatboard in hardy plank. The windows will be fiberglass, doors and windows will be fiberglass frames. And you can see we have uh, uh, selected colors already for the building. Uh, we did 
revise our traffic study by Jack Gillum Associates, and I'll just read you the executive summary, which is two sentences, three sentences. Uh, 18 apartment units will generate approximately 13 trips during the morning weekday peak hour, and 10 outbound trips, uh, 13 trips, 10 outbound and three inbound. So each day you'll have 10 outbound trips and three inbound trips for this project. As can be seen by these two exhibits, uh, the projected traffic impact on the neighborhood streets due to this project will be de minimis, which is negligible, especially after discounting the trips previously generated by the two multifamily homes. So, I know we're not in front of the zoning board, but we have a zoning analysis for this project. We will need relief for two items. One is lot size, and one is lot frontage. We do not need relief for height, FAR, which is your density of multiplier, uh, setbacks, parking, open space. We have fulfilled all those requirements of the zoning district. So only two uh, sections of the code we need relief from. Lot size, lot size and frontage. And with that, I will turn it over to the board for questions. Oh, I'm sorry, where's my, I have a civil engineer here. I apologize. We'll get skip over. <laughs> my name is Michael Joyce, Joyce Consulting Group, the uh, engineer for the project. Um, just to follow up on Tim's point about traffic, I think Tim, you said 10 trips outbound, 3 trips inbound, that's during the peak hour, that's not okay. all day. But uh, I think the traffic report estimated 120 trips over the day for the, uh, the project. But so, as Tim had mentioned, uh, we have 14,200 square foot lot, uh, about an 11 foot di uh, difference in grade from the Johnson Ave side to the Gilson Road side. Gilson Road is 11 feet lower. Uh, currently proposing a 18 unit building with 21 parking spaces inside, six parking spaces off of the Johnson Ave on the interior. Um, 15 in the lower level of Gilson Road and then eight service spaces. Uh, the, there'll be ADA accessible spaces both in the garage and one out in the exterior parking area. Um, the proposed stormwater will be collected from the roof and, and roof leaders directed to an infiltration area below the parking area. The uh, parking lot runoff will be collected be a catch basin, a storm scepter inlet catch basin, which will treat it, uh, will remove the oil and grit, and also direct it to the infiltration area. It's a very similar system as was proposed previously. The dimensions that have just been sh shifted slightly in order to make it, um, now that we have added space in the parking areas, shifted away from the, the property lines a little bit more. Um, we're also proposing new water, sewer, gas services to the building. Uh, the proposed transformer will be off of Johnson Avenue to the south of the, the building. All the sidewalk, new, there'll be new concrete sidewalks in the area of the proposed project. Um, the addition of ADA compliant ramps at Linden Court and then also across Gilson Road to Linden Court. Uh, the inter interior parking spaces will be curved. Uh, landscape surrounding, and uh, I think that's that's about it. Any questions? Could the applicant walk us through the um, discussions with uh, the city council and the neighbors um, since you were last before the board? The discussion was there was a concern about the. Residence A issue, they pulled it out of Residence A, they cut it back, put it into the business sector, and then there was the issue about parking, and they pulled it within the footprint of the building. <coughs> was there a public meeting? I'm sorry. I mean, the, the what uh, happened between the, the last meeting and... The developer uh, spoke with the counselor, and then the counselor posted it to her website. Okay, so no public meeting? No. Okay. Members of the board, Paul Hines, Assistant City Solicitor. 
Council of the Forest is involved in the Finance Committee meeting upstairs. Um, she said she was down there, but she was just called up for a vote. She is asked that uh, you allow her the opportunity to speak to the matter, so if you can defer her public question right until she returns, she, she may be able to inform you as well. Sure. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions from the Okay, this is a uh, continued public hearing. Um, so I would ask anyone who wishes to speak, uh, identify themselves, and um, hopefully accommodate them. We have um, sheets over on the windowsill um, for those that don't want to speak, that want to be recorded. Uh, so, turn this up. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Andrew Sutton, Weber and Bronstein, 3 Central Plaza, Boston, Massachusetts, representing the owner of the lot, uh, Sullivan Tire property. Uh, I can answer your question, uh, Vice Chairman Barry. Um, there has been no discussion with the abutters, and I was frankly surprised that there was no <laughs> outreach given my lengthy comments at the last meeting. Um, point of fact, I'm not going to raise or debate zoning issues with respect to the property. I disagree that it's only two relief requests that they're going to need to make. Um, I could just point out uh, an accessory parking issue that I'm seeing right there in the RA district where guests aren't necessarily allowed to park in the RA district. Um, but we'll leave that for the ZBA. Um, my concern is this. We're here tonight not to throw shade on this project or cast dispersion. Our issue and a lot of the other, uh, other butter issue has always been scope. And we're seeing the project scale down. It's headed in the right direction. But what we hoped by appearing at the meeting was the ability to sit down with the developer and try to avoid any further issues with their process so that the town can realize the redevelopment of the blighted property uh, that, that they purchased. Um, that, that really hasn't happened. Uh, I would prefer not to have to continue to oppose this design, and I would hope that the board would suggest uh, that the developer sit down with the abutters, which, you know, frankly, I think everybody here thought was probably going to happen. Um, I've been following uh, Councillor uh, LaForest's blog, and she only updated it on May 30. And, you know, that, that, that wasn't... Uh, a significant amount of time to reach out to the neighbors. So effectively, I'm surprised at the developer's lack of communication or consideration for the issues raised by not just the commercial neighbor, but the residential neighbors to, to see if this design works for them. I understand their time frame and their timetables, but I really do think that if we sat down and maybe took this to another meeting, we would be able to get a plan before you that might work for everybody. Yeah, I'm Richard Garrigan, I live at 28 Turkey Hills Road, and uh, no one reached out to us, and I live directly, and it, they point out that this is a five-story building, whereas in actual fact from Kilson Road, if you flick the page, it's a six-story building. Do you want to find the page? And that's my point, that's been my argument all along, that in a neighborhood of predominantly single and two-family homes, you're going to have a six-story Building, people with this issue, and this is Gunson Road, I live here, the six stories. So that's my point. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wants to speak, sir? Yes. Joseph, Joseph Shaheen, the owner of 14 Johnson Ave. We're still talking about the same things of parking and driveway from 14 Johnson Ave. If you're talking about 128, if they said the correct amount of cars come and go, that street is driveway. It's not a street. It's one way. So it's no two cars will go into that, uh, that street. So when you go in, you have to, somebody has to move to the sidewalk for them to pass. Again, when you get to uh, uh, Hancock Street, okay, there's no view to the people coming and going from Hancock Street. So you have to cross the sidewalk of Hancock Street for you to see the car is coming and go. And then, where the snow is gonna go? If the people parking on, on that driveway on the street, it's only one car. This is two car garage. 
So it's one way it goes back and forth. How they can be imagine, you know, going back and forth when it's only one car can go in this direction. And there is no for police or, the, or a fire department. And it's, it's the right way, you cannot use the right way. They are using the right way. That's illegal for them to use that. I have the right to go there. And like anybody else. And uh, when you have that kind of high building, we are we are close. I don't know. There's no there's no distance between me and and uh, uh, 18 Johnson Ave. It's like probably eight feet or ten feet. That's going to be all. Everything is blocked from the from the uh, north shore, from the north of the house of 14 Johnson Ave, and from the uh, south of the Johnson Ave. That's going to be blocked. It's like it's it, 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 not existing. That's the only thing I can say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Anyone else wants to speak? If you want to. Mr. Hines. Again, members of the board, Paul Hines, Assistant City Solicitor. Uh, the Planning Department did ask me to review the issues with regard to the right of way that is so called Johnson Avenue. And I did provide the board with a memorandum, comprehensive memorandum back in April. And uh, following conversations with Attorney Sutter, um, I did give you a supplemental one yesterday, which uh, had requested, and I see that it's happened, to put an additional condition in the site plan review uh, permit, which required the applicant to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the law department their rights in Johnson Avenue and any rights that others may have, uh, including the portion of it that is on lot B, which becomes the footprint of a portion of this building. So I do see that it was included in, in, the, uh, in the recommended findings, in the recommended order. So I'm thankful for that. Um, if there are any other questions, I'm certainly here available for you. Thank you, Mr. Jane Hines. Any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Sure. Arthur Cannabis, uh, manager of the I Fred DeCenzo Trust, who are owners of the uh, Sullivan Tire. Uh, I haven't seen a copy of the of the uh, study done for traffic. Uh, I'm asking the board: Has the engineer uh, studied and addressed the problem that Mr. Shaheen actually has um, has brought forward? And we echoed and share his sentiments from the last meeting. If we were to drive down there tonight, I think I said this the first time, you would have a hard time making access or getting access to Hancock Street without being blind to the traffic coming from the left. So as you're traveling out the driveway, Sullivan Tires building is to the left. Sullivan Tires building is on a zero lot line. So effectively, you're right directly on the edge of our property line. Uh, it's made out of brick. It's not made out of glass. You can't see through it. <laughs> Any car that travels in a direction towards Hancock Street has to, by design, this is the way it was designed, this is the way it was done, physically go across the sidewalk in order to be able to get a sight line directly to the left. Now, I dare say there's a light there. We all know the lights are designed for traffic flow. They stop cars from going with a red light. They allow cars to go with a green light. <coughs> Unfortunately, through the laws of nature, not everybody follows these laws. Speeding tickets are given for going too fast. Tickets are given for going through red lights. In this particular case, on this particular Road. I use the word road because for all intents and purposes, I dare say when the developer goes forward for his financing, unless he's got a lot of money, he's going to pay cash out of his pocket, he's going to go for, for title insurance. I defy a title examiner to take a look at this particular street, road, access, easement, call it what you want, and be able to determine that the rights on Johnson Road are inherently feasible for the developer to be able to get this title insurance. So, as far as I'm concerned, my issue 
is safety. First and foremost, whoever comes out of that road and tries to beat that red light, tries to beat the yellow light, can't possibly see what's on his left. He's going to be looking left and right like we all do. But when he looks to the right, he can see perfectly well. When he looks to the left, he's going to see a brick wall. That, if there was nobody on the street, there was nobody going up and down that sidewalk, in one way, nothing should happen. But you have a center directly next door, which generates foot traffic. I don't know what the hours of operation of the center next door, maybe, maybe you gentlemen and ladies might be able to tell me, but people come out of there with baby carriages with kids. That's a health center of some sort. And if a person wants to beat that yellow light, just to get out on Hancock Street, like we all do, I've run through tons of yellow lights. I'm sure everybody here has probably gone through yellow lights too. It's only human nature. But in this particular case, in that particular area, you are creating an accident waiting to happen. I expect to get sued at some point if something isn't done to correct that particular problem. Keeping in mind that that brick wall is a brick wall. Cars go through brick walls all the time. We see it in the newspaper. We see it in, we see it in the news all the time. People go through brick walls, they get killed. Well, in this particular case, I really don't think that anybody's going to be going that fast to go through this, this brick wall. But keep in mind, I've got people on the other side of that brick wall in that building. So the site itself really is not conducive to a lot of traffic, period. It was designed originally for three lots. How many people could be on those three lots? Four, five, six, maybe seven. Here you're telling us there's going to be 18 units. The traffic survey is telling us they're going to have only 10 people coming out during the morning and three people or four people returning. I can't remember what was said here. But I'd like to see whether or not the traffic survey does in fact the engineer does, in fact, address that problem of the building, our building, my building, on the left-hand side with access coming out to Hancock Street without creating a dangerous problem for whoever is crossing the street or coming across that driveway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I just wanted to point out that the, uh, this, the garage off of Johnson Ave is now significantly smaller than it was previously. I think previously it had 10 or 12 spaces. Now it has six proposed spaces, and I believe the plan is to have those assigned to residents so that there won't be any visitors access in through Johnson Ave. Uh, in addition, as uh, Mr. Cannabis had mentioned, there is a traffic light at the end of Johnson Ave, and that traffic light is actuated. So there's a traffic loop in the, the ground there prior to the sidewalk. Um, so that's just your knowledge. Can I make a point also, um, and it was brought up the last day about the size of these garage openings, like I think it was mentioned that are they going to, whatever size, that can two cars, you know, move in and out at the same time. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can ask that question. The garage door is now currently 12 feet high. Both of them. 12 if the board if the board wants to certainly uh, enlarge those doors uh, to whatever you think you guys can pass. Well I don't know what but I would say a minimum of at least sixteen feet, but that's in general terms twelve feet if you you walk at two cars. And a lot of these parking spots would like uh, um, described as compact parking spots. I mean it's not not on not on this plan, no. Not on this one. Okay. We, we, uh, Pretty true to the uh, required sizes. Okay. Uh, there are no comments. And that's all street parking as well. Well, it's all the building. That's correct. So we, show no contact contact. we don't show any contact space. Okay. Um, but we can certainly widen uh, uh, the doors. Okay. Uh, if, if the well, it would only make sense because I mean, you you already have traffic issues. Yeah. There's someone trying to get out. Someone trying to get in. They can't back down. Just you know, it's four dead end streets. You can't back out. Of either street, so that would be the yeah, There's no way, there's no room for two cars to go back and forth. Yeah, there's no room. 
only a 20 foot right of way that extends a lot across the health center land. So it's not as simple as a 25 foot area or an ave or a roadway. It's, it's, it really is more complicated and uncertain as to the width of the roadway down here, the status of that roadway. I, I mean, you know, it's, again, it's, it's an issue that I'm not going to try to dispose of. I've talked to Paul about this at length um, before the hearing, and you know, we, we both agree to disagree on some issues, but we both recognize that there are potential issues here with respect to the roadway that need to be resolved, which I think is reflected in your... Uh, if I could speak to that, we haven't had a disagreement on the width of the road. We've only had... Correct. A, I do not agree with you on... On, on, on other the issues, the other issues. I will say that of the reserve rights in Johnson Ave, nobody has a right to park on Johnson Ave. So if anybody's parking on Johnson Ave, that is an offender. 25 feet or even 20 feet is wide enough for two cars to, park, to pass. So I believe one of your conditions is that we're supposed to no parking on Johnson Avenue. But that, that is the status of it now. The rights of way do not allow the parking. It's a pass and repass only. Thank you very much. Anybody else that hasn't spoken? He's just thinking it. Sir. Yes, uh, Michael Griffin. I live at 9, nine and 11 Linden Court. And um, talk a lot about uh, Johnson Ave and the traffic there. But Linden Court is a dead end and also a private way. So my concern um, is the traffic impact on that street. And um, the car is now either trying to cut through, they, they always come down, look around. Um, I'm worried about the impact from all these, these trips. And cars trying to get by each other, somebody's got to pull down. Uh, that's where my kids play, down the end of the street. And we got cars coming down, turn around. So that's my, I'm on the other dead end. My major concern is the impact on the court and also parking. If they can't get me or they got friends coming over, will there be no parking on Linden Court? Um, or am I going to have we're going to have stuff have cars lining our street? Um, that's that's a very big concern. Okay, thank you, thank you. sir. David Brophy, Eleven Gilson Road. Um, I like that they've scaled it down and. Um, my concern is with the parking, um, Gilson doesn't have any sidewalks. Um, so if this does go forward, um, I don't know whether it's on the developer or on the city, um, but you need to make that into a sidewalk going up Gilson at some point um, and enforce the no parking that's supposed to be there. Um, because already there are plenty of people from the apartment buildings at the top of the road um, who park on the street, and uh, it might be a broader question for the city council in terms of no parking in general, and there's supposed to be no parking. Um, and just the, the entrance um, to Gilson Road from Greenleaf. Um, Greenleaf is a very busy street. People use it as a cut through, and uh, people park right up onto the corners. And so that's something that needs to be addressed. I don't know the traffic studies considering much about uh, the traffic flow on and off of Gilson Road, but you, it's it's a very difficult turn to make it every morning. And I'm not speeding through the cash and yellow light or anything. But there are people who are driving well over the speed limit and you can't see because of the cars. Um, so if you know if this type of thing goes forward, there's good, the city has to look at the streets and around it and the impact that it has um, because it does make for, for dangerous turns and for pedestrians as well. So, um, but the scale down size of it um, is much more appealing than the 24 units. Ideally, I'd love to see 15, <laughs> but uh, I much prefer the 18 to the 24. Thank you, Mr. Brogan. Anyone else who wants to go? Got everybody? Oh, and the, sorry, and the, uh, I read the fire impact survey and it said the water mains would probably have to be replaced in order to suffice the sprinkler system. That was in, uh, one of the things that Mark posted on our website. So and the, the pipes are pretty old on the street, I know, because my pipes suck. So that might be something that, I don't know if that's city or developer, but that's something that has to be considered. Mr. George. Uh, we did perform hydro flow tests. Uh, unfortunately, we're doing it. The uh, hydrant on Gilson Road actually broke, 
so we couldn't get a full run in Gilson Road, but we did get flows. It's probably because it's so old. Yeah, <laughs> no, so there, I, I don't know if it's been replaced yet, but it's planned to be replaced. Once that's replaced, we'll form the flow test. But um, the flow test, we did perform a flow test at the intersection of Greenleaf and Gilson, at the, uh, right in front of the community building there, at the intersection of uh, Hancock and Johnson Ave. Both, both items had really good flow. Um, so, like I said, once we have Gilson repaired, we'll also perform the test there. Um, the other thing, we are improving the sidewalks from only up to Linden Court. I think one of the problems, once you get further up, as you had mentioned, is yeah, once a lot of the parkings pull in towards the sidewalk. Yeah. The sidewalk doesn't exist. So, but. Anybody else that has not spoken? Counselor? So, good evening, uh, Margaret LaFarge, Road North Council. Just by show of hands, who is here in the room specific for this project? I, just, I missed a few of the comments out, and I just want to make sure I'm familiar with everybody here. Okay. So, board, good evening. Um, sorry for my multitasking story in my life. Um, as you know, you sounds there's a lot of more, I think, for the viewer at home to hear, is that a lot of this work is done with the planning board, the planning director offline that I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day of by policy of legislative position that I'm in. We had a lot of concerns at the last meeting. Literally, the document just arrived in my hands today. This is the recommendation of the planning board, and there's 26 conditions kind of addressing some of the comments that you're making. So literally half the press, this is in my hand, it's on my website. Um, what I did, just so that you're aware, is we had said before, is this going to happen June 8th? We sent out an email, letting people know about a week and a half ago. Did send them a reminder for the meeting. I think the same people have really been consistently concerned about this, and I appreciate you all took the time to be here and to speak up and share your concerns. Because a lot of what's been said is that I was going to say has been mentioned. A couple of things, particularly, Dave, you mentioned about that are in these conditions. I just want to share share specific. We had talked about. Um, pedestrian safety and improvements to the area being conditioned on this project to the um, commitment of the applicant not the city applicants shall provide a stop sign with a, um, uh, at Linden Court and Gilson Road and another one at Gilson and Greenway uh, applicants shall upgrade curb ramps at the following locations to be ADA compliant Gilson Road and Linden, Gilson Road and Greenleaf um, no parking signs on Johnson. I'm trying to think what else we had in here. I hear you on the sidewalk. I don't know. I know Gilson's pretty narrow, and I'm not sure it would have the width to allow for a sidewalk. But if well, we could there's get... a, it's already, it's already curved, but it's not. It doesn't have mm -hmm. a granite. It, it have... has asphalt berm, not curbing. Yeah, correct. Okay. On both sides. Okay. Does it have the width? So a lot of times on roads, it's a matter of. It's probably too narrow that if they're adding the curbing, curbing. But if we could get a commitment from the administration to take a look at making it a more you know, sidewalk, because what you're saying is then they're going to park on the asphalt berm. Yeah. If it was curbing, they wouldn't be parking on the sidewalk. And that would kind of help with the problem in the area. Well, you would be able to, you can't walk up the street. When you can't walk on the sidewalk, you have to walk. You have to walk on the street because they're parking on the sidewalk. Got it. So the other thing I think is important to hear, and I've had some phone calls and the police have been responsive. We're actually upstairs, that's the meeting's on tonight, is traffic and parking enforcement and you know what the strategy is because it's not what we have right now, it's not working. And it's kind of a, they're having people parking on their street, so this is the, the existing conditions is, hey, I'm going to park on the street, there's no lot of the T, where can I park, the parking control officer doesn't find me, Gilson Road's a great spot for that, they can tuck away in there. Um, so I'd like to see from the administration comments to go back to the Quincy Police Department. Captain Gillen's familiar with me calling on this area, but that we send the parking patrol officer there. They're, they're not having that impact. It does not belong in the neighborhood. And while we're right off Hancock Street, you know, clearly we've got neighbors here, and, and it is a little neighborhood um, tucked in the back there. So the other thing is 20 feet of an intersection. The rule is no parking within 20 feet of an intersection. It's a state law. It's ignored all over the city, and what it is is that that sight line that you're talking about to say for us to exit Gilson Road to turn onto Greenleaf in and out is difficult to see because of the visibility because people are parking there. So I hear you a lot on Claire. This is one of my biggest, biggest frustrations as a ward counselor. Um, okay, other issues. So administration comments, if those can go back. Heard it from the neighbors, heard it from me. There, that, that is the existing conditions. It's very frustrating. Um, the water, I think you had just addressed, and I was just going to speak up about that, about the fire flow. 
What do we say? Um, okay. Found adequate pressure in the, in the hydrants near the site, have made a condition to ensure adequate water flow with the fire department and water department prior to getting the building permit. So that's something that is conditioned in here. I will post this and I can actually give you guys this file and pass it around. Um, Councilor, I'm sorry if I could. Yeah. This is um, my recommendation that I typically give to the board. They have not um, actually gone through them all either. These may change before oh. they go. Okay, I wasn't yeah. quite sure we were in the process. Okay, yeah. so right. you'll see the extensive homework being done. I will say a lot of due diligence here. Margaret is the principal planner. It's been the you know the lead working with the applicant, working with the department heads, working in coordination on that. She has what? How many twenty six conditions on this? Uh, at, at the present time, but there may be a, a few additional items. So we don't have tonight. Have tonight. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Okay, so. I think with that, you've heard my concerns, a lot of it's been addressed. Uh, I kind of hoped that, it, you know, it's coming down to the midnight hour to try to get this onto the agenda. I, I think it's sometimes helpful as these things, you know, projects just as a point of reference get kicked down, kick, kick the can down the road. We really kind of have that summary, what changed? Because for me, I was hearing a lot of this for the first time while I got a few documents and had some homework that I could do in advance of tonight's meeting. Tonight was my opportunity to listen, and here I am running between two meetings. So that's just difficult um, on, a, on a policy perspective. So I think sometimes when you've got a project change with major changes like this, if we could get kind of an executive summary that's going to come out with the, with the new plans would be helpful going forward. A anybody else? Anything in particular where missing and felt wasn't heard? Okay. So with that, I'm looking forward to the, to the kind of your board's discussion and your, your input. And, Feeling like I missed some pieces. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions? Mark. Um, there, there were just a couple of items that we met with the applicants on Monday and went over a lot of the outstanding issues. Um, Tim, you, you were going to submit the trash plan. Did you bring yeah. those copies? We were unable to copy those today. Peter, Dave, do you have the copies I gave you? I'm sorry, the, Margaret, I thought they were submitted. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I thought we let have them on campus, too. Yeah. They, they were, we did discuss their trash removal plan. They made some changes to the site so that that would be um, more accommodating. Um, I think the, the other item that came in was the memo from Paul Hines, and he made some suggestions about the, I'm sorry? The, the memo spoke to the condition on Rice yeah. and Johnson. The other yeah. matters were just in an email form. Right, just that were in the email. Yes, and I have, I think you have a copy of that in your, in your back, I mean in your packet. Some of these conditions we, we felt we could <gasps> add without uh, too much discussion, but we did want to um, just have some discussion with the applicant about certain things. Um, the lighting on Johnson Ave, there was a suggestion to put a, a, a street light on the pole on Johnson Ave. Yeah. We, I, I did visit the site today. In fact, there are two telephone poles on Johnson Ave, but that couldn't be utilized. Well, what the question was, was we weren't sure how that process would work, whether the applicant would have the right to put a street light on, on the pole. Yeah, if the well, applicant. Um, my question today, and believe it or not, it has a street light on one of the poles. It just needs uh, fix. It just needs fix. You oh, couldn't, okay. couldn't see it underneath all the trees. <laughs> but it does have one there. There is one on the yep. light. Point. Which one? Where? Right in front of um, um, 18 Johnson, right in front of where they're on Johnson. I know. You got the two houses right there. The second one is from here. Right. Yeah, right. second one is from here. Okay. Then I think we could make a condition that they um, go through the process to repair that light and have the applicants. Um, the other one, the other discussion that we wanted to have was about the upgrades and repairs to Johnson Ave. It is, we understand it's a small road and does need certain, you know, repairs. Uh, it, it, it most likely is adequate for six more additional vehicles on the, on the um, site. But what we wanted to talk about was during construction, there could be the possibility of uh, damage. So what we wanted to condition was that if any damage is done during construction, the applicant's responsible to repair that. 
that we did make one of our conditions. Um, the other one was the idea of a fence um, between the, I, from, from your email, Paul, it, it seemed like it was from the corner of the building, but there is a fence there currently on the Sullivan entire property. So did they want them to extend it from that fence along their full property line? or? The fence that you refer to that is at Sullivan is, I believe, a four-foot fence, and it is in Sullivan Estate of District here. Yeah. <clears throat> and then to the next about it, there's a gap, and then there's another district repair fence. Okay. So the thought was, at the request of uh, Attorney Sutton, on behalf of his client, that they fenced from the Firestone building the full length out along Johnson Avenue. Sullivan Tire. Um, <laughs> I can say that all day. It was called the Jimmy's Tire earlier. It hurt my tenant. He got <laughs> right. mad with me. Sullivan Tire. From the corner of his building, <laughs> down the uh, abutting property lines behind Whitney Road, where they abut the so called Johnson Avenue, mm -hmm. up to the end of the project site. So it would dissuade people from parking on Whitney Road and passing on foot through the abutting parcels to get oh, to this development. So I admit, I read it after the fact, and if you made sense of any of it, then you better than I. But it runs from the building to the end of the project site, at, kind of at the butt of uh, Gilson Road. But between Johnson Avenue and Lot, Lot A, to the abutters on Rookie Road. Uh, myself and my brother, we were down tonight, and went where the gentleman's building is. We will put a fence at six foot fence all the way down Johnson. Okay. And tax the next one. And we have no problem with the fence. Okay. And rather than a condition, we, you can show that on the final plan. Um, those are the only issues that we had outstanding. The um, tracking of the fence. Other than that, we, that's about all that we were looking for at this point. Do you want to close the public hearings for a second? Second. Discussion, all those in favor? Uh, Aye. The department have a recommendation. Thank you, yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, based on the City of Quincy's interdepartmental review and the outside peer review, the department recommends that the board approve site plan review in accordance with Quincy Zoning Ordinance Title 17, Section 9.5.1 and special permit under Quincy Zoning Ordinance, Title 17, Section 5.1.17, for parking waiver subject to the following conditions. Um, the project is subject to the Inclusionary Zoning Ordinance. The applicant shall contact the Affordable Housing Trust Committee for their recommendations related to on-site units or cash in lieu of such units. Any recommendation by the Affordable Housing Trust shall be incorporated into the Planning Board Special Permit decision. Number two, the applicant shall seek approval from the City of Quincy Zoning Board of Appeals or Zoning Enforcement Officer as appropriate for any necessary relief or findings related to the City of Quincy Zoning Ordinances, as same are not under the authority of the planning board. Number three, um, due to some controversy surrounding the applicant's ability to build within the area identified as Johnson Avenue, Prior to obtaining building permits, the applicant or the applicant's attorney or other representative shall establish to the satisfaction of the Quincy City Solicitor that no rights were obtained by the then town of Quincy or others by virtue of such an applicant and which rights, if any, would prohibit the applicant from now building in the footprint of the so-called Johnson Avenue. Number four, the applicant shall provide the fire protection engineer system demand calculation for the building to the fire department prior to obtaining building permits. Number five, the applicant shall conduct a water flow test to determine if there is sufficient water supply in the street to support the sprinkler system and the required standpipe system demands in the building. This report shall be submitted to the fire department prior to obtaining building permits. Um, the Johnson Road is a private way and shall remain private. The applicant and owners of this development and any other owners of Johnson Avenue shall continue to be responsible for the maintenance of Johnson Avenue. Number seven, prior to final occupancy permits being issued, the applicant shall install no parking signs along the southern edge of Johnson Ave in order to discourage vehicles from parking on this road and possibly obstructing the flow of traffic to and from the subject site. Number eight, the applicant shall provide a stop sign and city standard pole with a 12-inch stop line on Linden Court at Gilson Road and on Gilson Road at Greenleaf Street. 
Number nine, the applicant shall restripe the crosswalk on Linden Court at Gilson Road and on Gilson Road at Greenleaf Street. Um, if I could just um, interject here also, the applicant did show us some revised plans that show additional uh, crosswalks on um, Gilson Road to get to Linden, Linden Street, or Linden Court. Uh, number 10, the applicant shall upgrade curb ramps at the following locations to be ADA compliant, Gilson Road and Linden Court, Gilson Road at Greenleaf Street. Number 11, the applicant shall provide a construction management plan to include detailed traffic management plans including temporary traffic control, crosswalk detours, construction truck routes, staging areas, and other protections at least one month prior to the start of construction to the city's traffic engineer for review and approval. No construction vehicles related to this project shall be allowed to obstruct vehicle access to the neighborhood of Gilson Road or Johnson Avenue or to obstruct access to any driveways of residents on these roadways. Number 12, the applicant shall be responsible to repair any damages to Johnson Ave that occur during the construction of the project to the satisfaction of the city's Department of Public Works. Number 13, hours for delivery of materials during construction shall be determined by the city's traffic engineer upon submission of the construction management plan. Number 14, the applicant shall submit documentation indicating that construction activities at 32 Gilson Road, 18 Johnson Ave will not result in rodent issues for abutters. The applicant shall develop a rodent control contingency plan prior to the commencement of construction activ activities on site, which will include the name and contact information for an on-call pest control company. Number 15, the applicant shall develop a dust control plan to be implemented during any site activities to ensure compliance with state air quality regulations. Number 16, the applicant shall commit to conformance with both local and state regulations regarding noise as the proposed construction could create noise generating activities. Number 17, demolition. Newly amended regulations require a pre-demo demo survey for any potential asbestos containing materials to be conducted by a DLI certified inspector. If asbestos containing materials are present, it must be removed by a licensed contractor and a post abatement inspection must be performed by DLI certified project monitor. A pre-demolition inspection of this structure will be required to be performed by the Board of Health Department. Number 18, the State Sanitary Code. The residential units proposed to be developed will be required to meet all provisions of Article 2 of the State Sanitary Code. Number 19, applicants shall install survey mon monuments to, be delin to delineate the public rights of way. The monuments shall be set by a professional land surveyor prior to issuance of occupancy permits. Um, upon completion of the project, the applicant shall furnish to the City of Quincy Building and Engineering Departments a digital file of as built plans showing all utilities, building footprints, reference bounds, and benchmarks defining the total site, facilities, and rights of way. 21, the applicant shall submit a stormwater operation and maintenance plan which shall be recorded at the Norfolk County Registry of Deeds and will include the following stormwater management system owner, the party responsible for operation and maintenance, an estimated operation and maintenance budget, and a maintenance log form. Um, okay, number 22 is uh, just further on with the uh, operation and maintenance plan. The owner shall be required to submit a copy of the completed stormwater operation and maintenance plan, inspection schedule, and evaluation checklist form stamped by a professional engineer annually to the City of Quincy Department of Public Works in order to document compliance with the approved o and plan. And one week prior to any land disturbance activities, the applicant shall conduct an on-site inspection with the City of Quincy and or the City's designated representative to observe the erosion controls installed at the site and review the erosion controls anticipated to be employed during construction. Number 24, at any point during construction, the applicant shall allow the City of Quincy and or the City's designated representative to enter the site for the purpose of making observations as to the compliance of site construction with the approved site plans and conditions of approval. Uh, number 25, the City of Quincy may at its discretion use consultants to supplement City Staff 4, but not limited to the purpose of site construction observation. The consultant review escrow account shall be fully funded 30 days prior to any land disturbance activities. And number 26, the hours for construction activities will be 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturdays. All construction and delivery shall be prohibited on Sunday unless approved by the Chief of Police. 
The hours for delivery of materials shall be determined by the city's traffic engineer through the construction management plan. I believe that covers everything that we've discussed. Any questions?